Hi, I'm going to be talking to you about the transformative power of cinema and how it can bring us together to work towards social justice. Back in 2005, I was commissioned to write a book about cinema. I was writing about the art of cinema, the entertainment, the industry, and all the rest of it. And in the process, while I was researching documentary films, I encountered a film about the Vietnam War. It was an Oscar winner made by Peter Davis in 1975. It is called Hearts and Minds. By the way, the title of the film is based on a quote from President Lyndon B. Johnson, who actually started the war. He said, the ultimate victory will depend on the hearts and minds of the people who actually live out there. While I was watching the film, I came to a sequence where General Westmoreland, who was the commander of all U.S. armed forces during the war, was talking to the camera, dispassionately proclaiming that, in his words, the Orientals, meaning Asians, do not value human life as much as we do in America. This was juxtaposed against the scene of a funeral of a Vietnamese man who was killed by the American forces. His little brother was sobbing uncontrollably, and his grieving mother throws herself in the grave. Suddenly, I started to cry. I sobbed and I sobbed. And it seemed like an eternity. I was crying so loudly that my wife heard me from downstairs and ran up in a panic and was asking me, what happened? What's wrong? I could not stop crying to answer her questions. At that moment, the reality of this powerful film that critically examines the issues of racism and doctrine of war had hit me like a ton of bricks. I was transformed. From that point on, I was committed to writing about films for personal transformation and social justice. My friends, that is the power of cinema. From my vantage point, the human society as a whole has to undergo a transformation. One that brings about democracy, egalitarianism, cosmopolitanism, and harmony with nature. There are various humanistic expressions that can assist us in this process. I am utterly convinced that cinema is the most effective vehicle for such transformation. Cinema, along with other image-saturated media, shapes our private thoughts and public minds. For the past 120 years or so, cinema has revolutionized the way we see and understand the world. A few years ago, I was having dinner with a friend of mine whom I hadn't seen in a long time. My friend, Tim, has a PhD in genetic science, and he actually works as a geneticist. Somehow, we started talking about Dolly, the sheep that was cloned from an adult cell in 1996. This scientific achievement had given birth to a myriad of ethical debates. And my friend posed an ethical question that many other reflective people around the world are also asking these days. What if we lived in a society where government mandated parents to choose the best genes to produce their children? Those who were lucky and received the best genes best suited for best positions in society would belong to the ruling class. All others would be relegated to various service jobs and have lower socioeconomic statuses. We both agreed that this, in effect, 
would produce a biological caste system. Right there and then, Tim said to me, ethical debates amongst ethicists and medical field professionals and geneticists tend to become very boring and people tune them out. So what's the point? So I asked, do people tune out good science fiction films that have these ethical debates built in their plot structure? He paused for a moment and said, I'm not sure. Does such a movie even exist? So I recommended to him to go see Gattaca, a science fiction film made in 1997 that deals with such issues. Then afterwards, we could discuss it. At first, he was dismissive. He said, well, movies are for entertainment, and how could a movie be of such value for me about these serious issues, and so on. But out of respect for our friendship, he promised to watch the film. Some time passed, and I'd actually forgotten about our conversation. But one morning, it must have been about 5 AM, I woke up to the loud ringing of my cell phone. And I thought it might be an emergency. So I quickly answered without looking to see who is at the other end. It was Tim. He was so excited, I could feel his excitement over the phone. Naturally, I was concerned. So I asked, Tim, what happened? What's wrong? And he was in a state of astonishment. He said to me, what brilliance. Dude, I believe in the human spirit all over again. You see, he believed in the optimism of the will all over again. Gattaca is a story about a not so distant future America that is based on a biological caste system. Those with the right genes are known as valids, and those with the inferior genes are known as invalids. The protagonist of the film, Vincent, is, a, is an invalid. And he decides to swim against the current and beat the system with will to power. Vincent's genetic makeup would have him become a janitor of some other job in that line of work. But instead, he wants to become an astronaut. He wants to go out there and discover new worlds. So Vincent, who is organically conceived, a love child, finds a way to falsify his records and pass as a selected valid and enter the astronaut training program. To be sure, the film has the usual stuff that we love about movies. The ups and downs, the element of surprise, the risk, a love story. But along the way, there is a serious premise that is reinforced. And that is that the human gene, there is no human gene for the human spirit. Recently, I assigned Do the Right Thing, a film made in 1989 by American filmmaker Spike Lee. This was assigned to my undergraduate students, mostly freshmen and sophomores ages 18 to 20. And about the same time, I went ahead and assigned the same film to my graduate students, who are doctoral students with master's degrees ages 26 to 50. Do the Right Thing is a fictional story about a two-block black and brown neighborhood in Harlem. And this is a neighborhood that is working class and poor. There are brilliant actors depicting colorful characters, a serious lead actor, writer, director. And the film blends tragedy and comedy flawlessly. There is a character that goes by the name of Radio Rahim because he roams around the neighborhood carrying a huge portable radio cassette player, blasting tunes and songs such as Public Enemies Fight the Power. In the third, yes, it is the third, 
third act of the film, Radio Rahim goes to Sal's Pizzeria, owned and operated by Italian Americans, Sal and his two sons. This is the only pizzeria in the neighborhood, and everybody goes to Sal's for a slice almost daily. As Radio Rahim enters the pizzeria, blasting his radio cassette player, Sal demands that he turn off the radio because it bothers my customers, he says. Radio Rahim refuses. A shouting match ensues. Sal gets real angry, grabs a baseball bat, and while issuing racial slurs, smashes Radio Rahim's radio. Right there and then, the two men start fighting, and the cops show up. They grab Radio Rahim and choke him to death. Then they throw his body in an ambulance and flee the scene. At the end, it is a war between ordinary people against other ordinary people while the cops get away with murder. After the viewing assignment, I got together with my students, both undergrad and grad students. Passionate discussions took place. People were excitedly talking about issues of justice, fairness, racism, why black lives matter, and all of them, almost all of them, spoke about the necessity of a solidarity between white, black, brown, Asian, and Native Americans to come together and fight for social justice. They had been awakened by this story. My friends, 32 years later, do the right thing remains relevant and necessary. The reality is that cinema brings the kind of perspective that we need. The reality is that cinema does what theater used to do back in the age of Shakespeare, except cinema does this at a grand scale. And what is more, we do not need to go to the theater to have profound and sometimes transformative experiences vis-a-vis -vis cinema. Cinema gives us an opportunity to experience other perspectives and an experience that can bring us to other worlds and contemplate other ways of being. These days, the pandemic has everyone involved in doing life differently. Almost everyone is dealing with the pandemic. And many people spend their free time streaming movies and television shows. To be sure, there's a lot of mindless stuff out there. But there are gems to discover and reflect upon, too. Pandemic, as horrific as it has been, has also given us an opportunity to pause and contemplate other ways of being, other ways of living. We can drive less. We can cook more. We can spend more time with our families. We can buy less. We can be kinder and gentler to one another. We can spend our time entertaining ourselves in healthier ways other than things like ocean cruises that pollute the ocean and the air. We can be more generous. We can be more compassionate. We can help our brothers and sisters around the globe. Cinema can help us in that regard. Recently, in an online forum where I lead a thinking salon, I suggested to the members of the salon to watch a recent Italian film featuring the legendary Sophia Loren, who is now 86 years old. The film is called The Life Ahead. I suggested that they watch the film and reflect upon life. The next time we got together, 
I was astonished at the dialogues that ensued. People were admitting about their naivete about moral issues that this little Italian film had opened their eyes to, as if they had discovered another way of living. The life ahead is about an unlikely friendship between Madame Rosa, who is an elderly Italian Holocaust survivor, and Momo, a 12-year-old Senegalese refugee who has to do drug dealing in order to survive on the streets. Momo is an orphan. Madame Rosa regularly takes in orphans and children who've been abandoned by sex workers who are their parents, and she brings them to her house and gives them tough love and care and kindness. Madame Rosa, as a survivor of the Holocaust and a former sex worker herself, understands the suffering of these children and has profound empathy for their suffering and how they have to lose their innocence to survive. Towards the end of her life, the only person that comes to help her and offer her kindness and care is Momo. My friends, the life ahead is cinema. You see, Cinema has a consciousness of its own. It's aware of us. It gives us diversity through the cinematic experience. We have access to perspectives, cultures, other countries, other people, other ways of being that would normally not be available to us. Cinema teaches us that if you reach the end of the rope, tie another knot. Hope dies last. Love, kindness, and dignity matter most. Cinema makes the impossible possible, and we can experience the impossible repeatedly in the comfort of our own homes. You see, through the vicarious cinematic experience, we have an opportunity to alter our consciousness and see a deeper reality. And that can be transformative. I'd like to close with a quote from one of my favorite auteur filmmakers, Martin Scorsese. He said, cinema is a matter of what's in the frame and what's out. Thank you.